Y'all got questions about Nazir Little? What a bigger role looks like for Yusuf Nurkic? Whether Blazers are dark horse contenders? It's a mailbag episode. Let's get into it. <laughs> You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter Mike Richmond. You are listening to a, another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts, including now on YouTube. If you're watching live on YouTube, hello and welcome. If you have not joined us over on YouTube, make sure that you search YouTube on whatever device, your phone or your computer, and subscribe to Locked On Blazers and support the show. I would truly appreciate it. Today's episode is a mailbag special delivery episode. We do this each week. Uh, typically, we record it on Mondays. I call it Mailbag Monday and post it on Tuesdays, but because of the way this week worked, we bumped it back a little bit. It's a special delivery mailbag, but it's still the same deal. Answering listeners' submitted questions all episode long. So if you want to get involved in a future one of these bad boys, here's how you do it. You tweet at me, at Mike T. Rich on Twitter. Just send me a tweet whenever you're thinking of it. Or uh, and it helps when you're sending me that tweet. If you tag it as mailbag in some way, that way I know that it is specifically for the for the podcast and not just a question you have uh, for me on Twitter. If you are not a Twitter user or just someone who doesn't tweet, you can send me an email, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com is the address. That's lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Like I said, we do this each and every week and neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays mailbag from your ear. So let's get into it. Our first question comes from Zach who asks, I believe that this is the best roster, the best the roster has looked since LaMarcus Aldridge left. And I don't see how, if everyone stays moderately healthy, that we're not a sleeper contender. This year will be one of the first that Dame possibly won't have to play so much to the point that he is gassed in the playoffs. And we might, that's a collective pronoun for those of you scoring at home, we might have a fresh team and high seed in the playoffs for the first time as well. If everything does swing our way in the regular season, could you see us contending come playoff time? I think the short answer to this question is yes. Like, yes, absolutely. If everything goes the Blazers' way, they can contend. Sure. I, I think the longer answer is that is that I don't see them as a contender. And I, I want to be... I think this time of year is the right time to be excited. I don't want to. I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. But you asked me a question. I want to answer it honestly, Zach. I, I don't see the Blazers as a contender. Um, I think health is is going to be really important for them. But I, I, even if healthy, like even if like you said, we assume moderate health, I still think they're missing a wing defender. Like I just, I don't think they've addressed that need for a high level point of attack defender on the perimeter. Norman Powell's pretty good at it, um, but he's not like he's not a lockdown guy. He's he's. Um, He's a better offensive player than he is a defensive player, right? Like that's, he's just, that's his skill set. I'm, I'm a Norm fan, but I know what he does. I think Larry Nance helps. Um, he's a, he's a defensive versatility and, and, and he's, I think he's, he's going to add some, some, uh, he's going to add some juice on that side of the ball for sure. But you can ask him to guard high level wings for, you know, 30 minutes a night. It's, um, it, it's not going to work. It's same with Robert Covington, um, really good defender, but not a point of attack defender, an elite help defender. But if you put him on the ball, he gets exposed a little bit, particularly against like the really high level star wings. Uh, I think they'll, you know, with, if Nurk is healthy and, and the addition of Cody Zeller, like, I think they're going to be better on defense. I think that's real. I think they're going to be just like generally better than they were last year um you know maybe maybe like similar win percentage but like they're they're i think they're going to be a better basketball team um but that said it's just the, the the leap that they have to make from what they were last year when they were pretty much healthy and they lost to the nuggets who were missing uh you know all of their starting back where they got beat up by faku Kampazu and austin rivers the jump they got to make from there to like competing for a title seems pretty wide. And as much as I, I really like what the Blazers have done, like I, I, I've liked their recent set of moves. I really like Norman Powell. I like the addition of Robert Covington. I like Larry Nance Jr. I think Cody Zeller is a solid add too. Like I like what they've built this year, but I just, I don't see it. Even Damian Lord, who is the rosiest, most optimistic, just stubbornly optimistic. I've, uh, I've, I've kind of teased him before about it in the past, but like, uh, he is he is just just relentlessly and authentically optimistic. Even this year at Media Day, he didn't have that same rosy outlook. He was 
more realistic. Like, I think we're better. And when the games start, we'll see what happens. And I kind of agree with Dame. I don't like in the past, Dame would have talked about Larry O'Brien trophies and chasing championships and all those things. And he was still talking about believing it can really happen. Like he was still very clear. It can still happen. He knows, you know, um, teams like the Suns and the Warriors were not, you know, before the Warriors dynasty weren't really picked to be a, to make the jump. And they did. And the same with the Suns. Like, I think people thought the Suns would be really good, but like making the finals good. I'm not sure that that was um, a consensus thing. Obviously last year was weird whatever but like i so i i recognize that the blazers could surprise me but if you're asking me right now on september 28th as i'm recording this i don't really see it like i i, I just want to be honest with you i see them as a good team i see them as a team that could you know if things go their way be a western conference finals team and competitive in that that world but like just straight up i don't i don't it is they are super long shot contenders if they can be one but like the the basic answer to your question the short answer is yes because if if things do break their way if if they're healthy and other teams are this team is as is is better than they've been and better than they've been should put them if they get a bunch of breaks to put them in the right right spot like luck luck will have to play a part um but it might have to play a bigger part than maybe you're giving them credit for zach Next question comes from Olan Fulfer, and that's Fulfero3 on, on Twitter who asks, at Fulfero3 on Twitter who asks, I have really high hopes for Nazir Little and see him as a major candidate for most improved player this year, if given the minutes. I loved Coach Stotts, but I really thought Little needed way more minutes and would have blown up last year if given the chance. Am I being realistic expecting a huge jump? Again, I think the short answer is yes. You're, that's realistic. It's realistic to think that Nizer Little is going to take a big jump that this last uh, this season, not last season. That has already happened. Realistic to think Nizer Little is going to take a big jump this season. Um, one of the reasons why I think is just because he didn't get a lot of opportunity last year. And I want to be clear here. I've said this. I've said this um, before. And I did a whole uh, season preview podcast episode on Nizer Little. It's in your feed if you want to go listen to it. There's 35 minutes uh, waiting for you on all about Nas, what he did last year, and what I expect him to be this year. But like the, I think down the stretch in the final 14 games of the season, when the Blazers kind of switched to an eight man rotation and really made their push to the playoffs, Nas didn't deserve to play in that 14, in that 14 game stretch and into the playoffs. He wasn't one of their best eight players. Uh, Stotts tightened the rotation and, and it was the right, it was the right move. Um, it was the first 66 games or, or 58 games, I guess, if they put a 72 game season, the first 58 games. That's when Nas needed minutes. You needed to find out what you had because you never did, and then it was too late, and then you couldn't you couldn't figure it out. It wasn't you got to the point where you couldn't you couldn't be patient. Nas needed minutes in those first fifty eight games, and obviously he had a weird weird year. Uh, you know, got COVID and missed the first start of the season, so he missed training camp, and you know it's it, it, it's he had a he had a, a a weird start to the to the year, a challenging start to the year, and I think that set him back a little bit. But like one of Terry's failings was he didn't really trust young guys, um, and there were times when Nas looked out of place, but I think he deserved a chance to find out how out of place. Like he deserved enough minutes. Some of that is the roster um, and the, what they were promising Carmelo Anthony and blah, 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 blah. But like he, you got to figure it out. You got to figure out one way or another if he can play and, and, and he needed more opportunity for sure. So on the MIP front, I don't see Nazir Little as a most improved player candidate, like the award. I see him as improving a ton. Like, um, if the shooting is real, um, you know, he talks about adding a little bit of uh, passing ability to his game. If he adds a little bit of playmaking and just sort of better um, defensive IQ, he's got defensive tools. It's just he didn't always seem to be in the right spot because kind of out of um, out of place a handful of times. If like he can if he can settle those things. Right. Like if he can be a little a little bit better on defense and the shooting continues to improve and he um, adds a little, you know, tightens up his handle like he and, and all those things are doable this year. Like he could be doable. He could take a huge jump, to, huge jump rather to being like a high level NBA contributor. Like it's it could be it's a real thing that could happen for him. And that's like, he, you know, if he if he if he makes the jump from like fringe guy to ball player he's it'll be a massive improvement and considered a huge victory for the blazers but mip you need shots and you need minutes and i don't think i don't I, like with dame and cj and more shots for norman powell and more shots for nurk which they both talked about that the coaching staff has talked about getting them more involved like where's the points going to come from mip goes to guys who score uh nas can be a really good player but i don't think it's going to end up in a hardwood like I, he can be really helpful and really um like a really good story for this team but it's like 
it seems unlikely just the way the award works that he'll end up with some hardwood. Speaking of that, Connexion Blazers, at Connexion Blazers on Twitter, asks our next question, who do you expect to take a bigger leap this season, Nas or Ant? And it's Nas because he has more, more rungs up the ladder. Like, Anthony Simons is an NBA player. He has a bankable NBA skill, and he's a shooter. Like, um, he his step to like go from like NBA contributor to NBA starter is a pretty steep step, but that's less room than Nas from like a guy who doesn't play to a guy who contributes every night. And I think Nas can easily make that jump. And I think he's going to make a bigger, bigger leap. Nas might not end up better than Ant, right? Like Ant is better than him now, been more productive than him now. And I think like Nas could make a pretty significant jump and maybe not catch Ant and like overall impact. But in terms of just like from where they are today to where they could be in, in May, I think it has to be Nazir Little for taking the bigger leap next season. Next question comes from Alex who says, I'm a loyal Coug fan. Uh, that's for those of you who aren't familiar. That is the Washington State University Cougars. If you uh, if you are not uh, living in the Northwest or maybe not the United States or maybe just don't call, follow college sports, Washington State Cougars. So needless to say, I'm a diehard CJ Ellaby fan. I have both home and away colors of his jerseys. I know the expectations are low for him this year, but do you see him getting any rotational minutes this year as a 10th or 11th man? I don't. I don't. Um, and that's not really a knock on CJ, CJ Ellaby. That's just a, the situation with the team. Like the, the starters that Dame, CJ, Norman Powell, Robert Covington, Yusuf Nurkic, the first three guys off the bench, I think, are set. Anthony Simons, Cody Zeller, Larry Nance Jr. That's eight. That's eight. So he's he's now at best at nine. I think nine, the battle for ninth, is is Nazir Little, Tony Snell, Ben McElmore. I think those three are battling for nine and ten. So if you assume all three of those ahead of are ahead of um uh CJ Lb, you're talking about he's at like 12, right? Um and I think whoever they sign in out of training camp, there's four guys competing for the last roster spot they're going to keep in training camp, and that's Marquise Chris and Pat Patterson and Dennis Smith Jr. and uh, Quinn Cook. Both of those guards are better than than CJ Ellaby, and they play point guard, which is like um, more valuable for what the Blazers need. I don't think, assuming health, I don't think CJ Ellaby has a path to play, and that's just the way the roster is set up, and the way the position the Blazers are in, they don't they're the the like minutes they have allocated for like a player to see if he pops those are for nas <laughs> those are those are for nas those aren't for cj Ellaby. it is not necessarily a knock on him that he's not going to play in year two he's a second round pick if he pops and sticks in the league then it's it's considered a success and year three is a big year for him but um i don't i do not see a path forward for i don't see a path for him to be a, a contributor this year uh if assuming the rest of the roster is perfectly healthy all right, let's come back in the second segment, and answer more of your questions on this glorious mailbag Monday. But first, let me tell you about Sweatblock. Uh, specifically, I want to talk to you about, a little about Sweatblock wipes. They are more powerful, more effective than most clinical antiperspirants. And here's how they work. You simply apply them to your underarms at night before you go to bed or wherever. If you're a heavy perspirer, you know where you're going to need Sweatblock wipes. Apply before you go to bed. Rest your sweet little head. Wake up the next morning, take a shower, and go about your day with confidence and without worry guaranteed. In fact, if Sweatblock doesn't work, you get your money back. That's what they call the dry shirt guarantee. They're confident in their product, and they are offering you a chance to be confident in your own skin. And, you know, you don't have to trust me. Uh, I am simply, I am simply uh, you know, giving you the ad copy. But I'll tell you what, right now on Amazon.com, Sweatblock is currently the number one product in the antiperspirant category, and it's been a bestseller on Amazon for over 10 years. And on their website, on Amazon, a powerful e-commerce tool uh, you may be familiar with, there's over 13,000 reviews. That's that's t- literally thousands of thousands of people who have used the product, reviewed it, and, and say that it works for them. So go check it out. And when you're ready to buy, go to sweatblock.com and use our promo code. That's locked on. You get 20% off. Or... If you want to shop at Amazon, it's available there as well as your local CVS. Today's show is also brought to you by rockauto.com, the family business that's been serving auto part customers for over 20 years. Listen, Rock Auto specializes in helping do-it-yourselfers. That's what they do. So if you are someone who works on your car, if you know how to fix your car, this is the place you can go because you can save 30, 50, or sometimes 100% compared to shopping at a box, a big box, a chain uh, auto parts store. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go through the hassle. They don't have the parts you need. And if they do, they're going to be more expensive. Skip the hassle, save some money, go to rockauto.com and find a solution for all of your auto part needs. That's rockauto.com, 
See all the parts available for your car or truck. And while you're there, make sure you write locked on in their how did you hear about us box. That way they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. All right. Let's keep it rolling on this glorious mailbag Monday. Our next question comes from Dave. Dave asks. I know we've talked about Nurk getting more involved in the offense this season, but outside of his personal improvement on layups and unnecessary fouls, what does this look like? It doesn't seem like there's much else he could be doing out of the pick and roll, right? Surely more post-ups aren't the answer either. What kind of play should we be expecting? Brandon Sprague, that's at Brandon Sprague on Twitter, who uh, the host of Dirt and Sprague, 1080 The Fan, 6 to 9 a.m. on your radio dial, also available on the Odyssey app. It's a professional radio plug for a professional radio man, my friend Brandon Sprague. Also host of Jack Ramsey's, a a Blazers podcast available wherever you get podcasts. Brandon has another question about Nurk, and Brandon asks, Nurk's made a lot of noise about wanting the ball ball more. So my question is, what is more likely? Nurk getting more touches slash heavier offensive load, and CJ takes a step back to make it happen, or CJ doesn't, which means Nurk doesn't get what he wants. So let's talk about like what that means and then what how I think this plays out, right? So um, Chauncey talked about getting Nurk involved as a uh, as a high post facilitator. Uh, he talks about either out of the high post or at the top of the key. So that's like either elbow spot, the corner of the lanes or the top of the key. I think you'll see Nurk there with guys moving off of the ball, you know, off ball screens and cutting and stuff like that. The Blazers were a really bad cutting team. If Chauncey convinces this team to cut off the ball, uh, they could be really good. Damon CJ have never been particularly good cutters. CJ runs a lot, but he runs a lot to like get himself free and then dance. Um, he's he's not like a great like cut into space and, and like immediately um you know, punish someone. So I, I think Chauncey could maybe coax a little more, but you know, a player movement out of both of them. And Nurk as that facilitator could uh, could make it happen. I also want to see Nurk in the post. Like I want um, not post ups. I'm not really wild about Nurk um, posting up, but Chauncey did talk about getting him more post touches. So like instead of like two or three, getting him like you know four or five a game. Um, that's probably too many for me, but. It, Sometimes you got to make folks happy, so we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. But I want Nurk to get the ball in the post to be a facilitator because I think it changes the geometry of the floor. Um, you can run split cut actions, which is like when two guys come together and they kind of make a read. Either you know, either you down screen or you uh, you know set a set a pin down. So you screen screen for the guy going away from the basket or screen for the guy going towards the basket. You cut off each other. You make plays and let Nurk read sort of read that split cut. Like that's that split action. Um, out of the post. And I think that kind of, um, it's more challenging from that area to guard. In my opinion, the Warriors do this a lot with Draymond Green. Uh, I think that could be useful, but to brand. So that's what I think it looks like. And to Brandon's question, like what is more likely, I think early on, we're going to see them feed Nurk. Like I think Nurk's going to get, he's going to get to eat early on. The question is like when they're like, you know, 12 and 10 or whatever in the first 22 games or it, there might, yeah, I'm not, I don't know, not dooming them to like kind of a mediocre start, but like, you know, when, when things aren't, perfect uh for this team do the guards break it off does, does cj say cool you know nurk got his shots but like i'm one of the best scorers in the league screw this you know uh i think it's very likely that the first 10 to 15 games that we see them buy into all of this and then after the sort of feel out process the honeymoon process with a new coach um listening to that cj says listen I know why I make all the money I do. <laughs> like, I'm not confused about why I got all this cash. I'm just going to go do it. So I think like by the end of the season, it'll normalize. I don't think, but early on, early on, I'll bet Nurk. And by like, check, let's check in at Christmas. And then I bet it kind of evens back out. And CJ says, I'm going to go ahead and get mine. Cause listen, he's really good at scoring. It's the best thing he does. Um, he's, he's, uh, Nurk talks about a bunch of guys sacrificing one or two shots. Um, it's more than that because it's CJ sacrificing one or two shots, Dame sacrificing one or two shots. So those shots go to Nurk and then those got shots go to Norm. And then if you're talking about, uh, you know, getting other guys involved, do you, you can't totally freeze out Robert Covington. And when, uh, you know, when Cody Zeller comes in, I don't think he's going to get a lot of offense through him, but he's going to have to do, he's going to have to like have touches and make, make decisions there. Anthony Simons wants to shoot when he's in the game. I think, um, Nazir Little is, is, um, you know, more shooter than passer at this point in his career. Like it's a lot of dudes want to eat. Uh, so 
the sort of egalitarian approach is really everything's rosy now when it's not rosy, when it's, when the honeymoon's done, when it's not all perfect, we'll see where it shakes out. And I kind of think people, this is why I think like players matter more than coaches. Players are going to settle in to do what they do. Um, but Chauncey has a, an opportunity to prove me totally wrong. And um, maybe he does. And it's like this like p- perfect, happy family. How about that? Next question comes from Dr. J who offers this hypothetical. I think the last two seasons of the roster has been built around the assumption that Zach Collins was going to be healthy and play a big role. To me, Larry Nance Jr. is a replacement for Zach, for the Zach role on the roster. So the hypothetical is, assuming that you got 70 good games out of both of them, and Zach played to his pre-injury levels, excluding salary issues, etc., which player raises our floor more and which raises our ceiling more if you had a choice? In general, which would be a better fit for this roster as currently constructed? I love this question, Dr. J. I think this is fascinating. I kind of think it's Nance in both counts, but I, I think there's a case to be made that Zach's just like rim protection defense during the regular season raises the floor so much that Nance's sort of like defensive versatility and what he might offer, while it's like valuable, it's it's not just like straight up keeping dudes from making layups like at, at sort of Zach's peak. But I, I think the versatility and the... Um, and the playmaking and and that, that sort of ability to play three, four, and five that Nance brings. I think that's, you know, he can't play a lot of three and he can't play a lot of five. He's like mostly a four, but he can play a little bit at, at either spot. And I think that versatility is more valuable. And I think that certainly raises the Blazers ceiling. I think the floor is a debate, but I'd probably take Nance in both spots. I just think like Nance is a better basketball player. He's been more productive. Uh, we're more talking about like the idea of Zach Collins and the idea of Zach Collins kicks ass. <laughs> like, like he's in theory, he's like a really good basketball player. Um, but Nance, even with his own injury history, for sure, is has been more productive and is a better basketball player. Like he's he's like straight up very good. Um, he's just, uh, you know, he's he's he has been on some kind of mediocre teams, and when he was on a really good Cavs team, he was like a bit part. He wasn't quite fully himself. Next question comes from Jared, who asks, "You always say that you should never trade away a top ten talent for a chance at getting a top ten talent in the draft." Yeah, that's true. Uh, certainly the Blazers shouldn't do that. Maybe other teams should. Jared continues. As a big hypothetical, if the Blazers could trade Dame straight up for any other top 10 player, which player would make them contenders? Which would improve them a little? And which would keep them about where they're at? And which would make them worse? So like, I think the answer is pretty much the same for like all of the 10 best players in the league. Like, And that can mean whoever you think it is. To me, it's guys, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, uh, LeBron James. Luka Doncic, James Harden, uh, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic. And there's some, I I was going to just like rip off a handful more names, but like among uh, Kawhi Leonard for sure. But like uh, beyond that group, right? Like that you kind of know that they're, that they're up in that echelon. I think all of them kind of make the Blazers about the same. Some of them improve them. Like, like Kevin Durant would improve the team a lot. Um, but like a James Harden for, for Dame swap, like that's about the same. That'd be a little bit different. Um, you know, Harden is a tank. <laughs> uh, it would, so it would feel a little bit different, but I, th- I think they're like, if you just switch them out they're they're like about the same level of team. I think the one guy sort of in that tier that isn't, um, that isn't for sure going to make this team better is Anthony Davis. And I mean that because um, I kind of think Anthony Davis is as a number one option, a worse choice than Dame. And what I mean by that is that uh, for number ones, for like your lead guy, you kind of want shot creation. And Anthony Davis doesn't do that. He's an elite defender, an elite playoff player because of that defense and a really good offensive player in his own right, but he needs help to get the ball. Like you got to get, someone else has to get him the ball. And I, I kind of think that's the limiting factor. Whereas Dame, you can just give him the rock and he can go, go get it. Like, there's a case maybe to be made that Anthony Davis and CJ McCollum together is a better basketball team, but to me, like he's the only one that makes them like that maybe makes them a little bit worse that maybe takes them. Everyone else seems to be about the same. And I think there's like a true echelon, like maybe like, maybe like LeBron, KD, Giannis types that make them better. Like that, like push them to that, to that, um, to another, another tier ahead of Dame, but not much like Dame's so damn good that like, there aren't, there just aren't many people that are like head and shoulders more effective than he is. Like for, for the most part, he's he's one of the really 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 good ones and just flipping him out player for player isn't isn't exactly 
Uh, it won't make that much of a difference for my money. Jared has another question, also rankings themed. What are your Bilt Bar rankings? And Jared notes that Banana Cream Puff came out of nowhere and solidified itself as my number one. Too bad it was only for a limited time. So here are my Bilt Bar rankings from 10 to 1. 10, raspberry. 9, strawberry. 8, mint brownie. 7, orange. I, I, don't, I don't love the... the uh, fruit flavors. My favorite fruit flavor, Cherry Barcia. That's number six. Five, I'll go German chocolate. Four, double chocolate. Three, coconut. Two, salted caramel. And one, cookies and cream. Those are my top 10. You can find your own top 10 by going to built.com using the promo code LOCKED15. You get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built. Dot com. Today's episode is also brought to you by betonline.ag, just the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. It's also the number one spot for pro and college football action, which is great because these weekends in the fall are packed with football. All day long Saturday, all day long Sunday, you get Monday night games, you get Friday night college football action, you get Thursday in the NFL, all weekend. Almost, almost damn near all week once we get Maction back on Tuesday nights. And and if you want to bet on football, betonline.ag's got odds on every single game. It's got props on damn near every game. It's got contests for, you know, if you want to bet on, uh, you want to get in on betting contests for either of the football leagues, either pro or college football, it is it is the spot. It's the number one source to bet on all that. So why don't you go to their website right now and do that on a mobile device or your computer. Use the promo code NFL100. And you will get a 100% welcome bonus. That's double your initial deposit just for signing up. A dollar for dollar match. Use promo code NFL100. If you want to get in on this, they're giving you a dollar for each dollar you put in if you are a new customer. So I don't know about betonline.ag, your online sportsbook experts. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. Still listening to Locked on Blazers. Still rolling through Mailbag Monday. That's actually a special delivery mailbag. It's typically Mondays, but this week it's coming into your ears Wednesday or later, depending on when you're listening to this. Also, make sure Locked on Blazers is your first listen every day. Listen, this is a daily podcast. I want to make you should make a part of your daily routine. The first and when you when you open up what your podcast app or you open up your YouTube app or we're, we're on YouTube, y'all. Make this your first listen. And then come back and make it your first listen the next day. Make it a part of your daily routine. I'm here for you, a daily Trailblazers podcast. So get your fix with a free podcast all about the Trailblazers. All right, our next question comes from Jesus Gomez at PianoMaster00 on Twitter who asks, I feel like we always hear about the whole team, how the whole team shows up for voluntary practices before training camp. How usual or unusual is this around the league? The same stuff. The same with stuff like Dame getting guys together in the offseason prior to camp. Is that usual or unusual? You know, that's it's relatively typical. Uh, the Like around the league, vets start rolling in usually after Labor Day, which is about when the vets came in. This year is a little different. Dame was, got married and went on honeymoon. So he, he wasn't even available prior to that. Um, it was unique when in like sort of the first post LaMarcus years when they were hanging out like in August, they got together in August and went to San Diego the first year that LaMarcus was gone. That is rare. That is, that is, you know, the whole team being here in August is very rare. Uh, A big core of the Blazers. Some of it is that like the, most of the league lives in Los Angeles and South beach. So they're not in market, but like Dame lives here. His family lives here. CJ lives here. Um, You know, him and his wife live here. So like, like the two main dudes are in town and around. They don't have to come back. They're here. They're, you know, they're 20 minutes or whatever from the practice facility. They can just, they can just drive there when they want to. Um, So that's unique. Uh, You know, this summer it was reported. I read in the story in the athletic that was like LeBron James got the whole Laker crew together in Los Angeles or excuse me, in Las Vegas to, to get workouts in. So like it happens around the league. It's, it's not um, the, it, it was, you know, four or five years ago the Blazers were doing something that was like kind of unheard of, but now like vets around the league trickle in, in the sort of post post labor day weekend is kind of when guys start to come back to their markets and get going. And that's about what we saw from the Blazers. That's, that's relatively normal. Sometimes on other teams around the league, uh, like vet vets, like, you know, like the, like true stars are a little slower just cause they, they're, they're, you know, they're you get years and miles on your body. You got to take care of yourself. You don't need to run back to the practice facility to, uh, to uh, get in pickup. But yeah, I, I don't think the Blazers are, what they're doing is wholly unique by any means. 
Next question comes from Liam who asks, what are your thoughts on the rumors of expansion? Would stars or would rookies view them as more handsome? Definitely rookies. Uh, expansion teams are bad. Stars do not want to go um, to go to bad teams. That's not how it works. They're, they're just going to play for the Lakers and the Nets. Um, yeah, expansion's coming. Like, it's coming. It's here. I mean, it's not here, but it's the, the, the owners want it. Um, relocation for teams is really unlikely. Uh, teams, if you if the league expands, um, you have to pay expansion fees and owners get a cut of those expansion fees and they want the money. Um, it's how billionaires do. Uh, they don't and they don't have to share that money with with the players. So that's that that is uh, that is the appealing part. So, yeah, it's coming. I think, you know, the next I would say f five to eight years, we're going to see NBA teams in Seattle and Vegas or Nashville or Louisville or something like that. Um, we'll, we'll, or maybe an international location. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But yeah, it's here. Like I think it's just it, it's it's a matter of when, not if. Okay. Our next question comes from Dustin, who asks, "How far do you think this last? How far do you think last year's Blazers team would go if they swapped CJ and Nurk for prime Carmelo Anthony and Kenyon Martin?" Whew. Okay. <laughs> Carmelo and Dame is a dream come true. <laughs> Like it is that prime Carmelo, like 08, 09 Carmelo Anthony, maybe like, maybe like 09 to 2011 Carmelo Anthony. Um, he was so, so good. Like so good. Um, one of just the great scorers that the game has ever seen. Um, him running two man game pick and rolls with Dame is just lethal. Uh, it is, woo, woo, do I love that idea? Uh, that is, that is fun. Um, but, but I think they run into a problem because the, you're trading their starting center and you're left with just Kenyon Martin and Ennis Cantor to deal with uh, Nikola Jokic and Rudy Gobert and DeAndre Ayton uh, and, and the aforementioned Anthony Davis. Uh, I think the size will come up and catch him a little bit. I mean, they'll be so friggin' good on offense and so fun, but um, like specifically swapping Nurk for Kenyon Martin seems like you're giving up too much size in this hypothetical. Seems like you're a little, it seems like when you play the elite teams with elite centers, you're just not big enough and having your best defensive center be Ennis Cantor. Um, well, if you follow the, the Blazers closely, you know how that went. Next question comes from 304 Raiders and Canes for life. That's at WVRN4L on Twitter who asks, best barbecue place in Chapel Hill, NC? <sighs> I don't know anymore. All of my life, I went to Allen and Son Barbecue. It's uh, out in the Hillsborough Road. It's like north side of Chapel Hill, right by my high school, like 15 minutes from where I went to high school. Um, and I went there as a kid and through through all my teenage years. But it closed um, during, you know, post-pandemic and et cetera, at, as many, many restaurants around the country took it at small businesses. So I don't have a go-to in Chapel Hill anymore. I love North Carolina barbecue. The... Uh, pulled pork, apple cider vinegar based barbecue of Eastern North Carolina is probably, if it's not my favorite food in the world, it's up there. It's, it's really has a special place in my heart. Um, I wish I was eating a plate of hush puppies and hash brown and hash browns, a plate of hush puppies and coleslaw and, uh, and, and play and pulled pork right now with sweet tea and that they leave the pitcher on your table and the, and the servers are mean to you. There's something charming about going to a Southern restaurant with uh, plastic, uh, plastic tablecloth where people are mean to you. That's real. That's Allen and Sons for me. That's like a really special place, but they closed. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if any of my listeners would know the answer to this. Maybe my dad, dad, <laughs> what's text me what the best barbecue place in Chapel Hill is when you get this. Um, because I don't, I don't know anymore. I, uh, sorry. Next question comes from Alex at AA, AA Lax one on Twitter who asks, will you roll the ball out and play wearing CJ, CJ's one, CJ ones with leaning? Yeah. CJ McCollum has a signature shoe with leaning. Um, the CJ ones. Yeah, sure. Sure. Like, <laughs> uh, I think they're kind of hard to get and I think they're pretty expensive. I play in Dame fours, um, that I'm loyal to the other dude in the back court, not like specifically, but, um, I, I, you know, Dame is coming out with the Dame eight this year, I believe. Like I'm, I'm four models behind. I got two pairs of fours. I love them. It's one of the best basketball shoes I've ever played in. Um, I'm probably not going to change up my style for Lee Nings, um, but I like them. I like the CJ shoes. I, I saw them and uh, they look pretty good to me. So um, 
I pr- I'm not going to buy them, but I have no, I wouldn't have any hesitancy if I got them. If someone from leaning is listening, um, you know, shoot your boy some shoes, but it's really hard to buy. I think it's really hard for in the United States to purchase leaning basketball shoes. I might be wrong, but I know that in the past it was very challenging. So um, yeah, I, it sounds cool. Yeah. Give, I, I'd love to have them. All right. Next question comes from Sean Morrison's lisp on Twitter, who asks, I saw an article in the athletic. Jason Quick mentioned that Anthony Simons, Anthony Simons having vastly improved defensive metrics over the back half of the season. Did I miss this? Is there some context missing here? Was he actually good defensively? So yeah, I read this. I read everything Jason writes. He's a good friend of mine and also the best reporter covering the team. Uh, you should subscribe to The Athletic and read what he writes. But And and I, the numbers weren't wrong. Like What he was providing was factually evident. But he was citing defense, individual defensive rating. And to me, that's not an individual stat. It's a team stat. Um, it's, you know, players do get a defensive rating based of when they're on the court. It's the number of points scored, uh, per hundred possessions by the opponent when they're on the court, like it exists. Um, you can track it, but to me, it's not, it's just, it's a, it's a collective stat. It doesn't on its own. It doesn't account for who, who Simon's played with or who Simon's played against, um, with my eyeballs. I don't think I saw the, him get better on defense. Um, I didn't see it. They, it, it's it, the numbers might be real, um, even though I don't agree with like the specific use of those numbers. But like um, to me, it just it didn't happen. It did, I I missed it also, Sean. Next question comes from Credence, who asks at Credence twenty six on Twitter, who asks. Recent media reports have vaguely alluded to Neil only wanting only wanting to trade Ben Simmons straight up. Do you think that is legit or just posturing? So these aren't vague reports. This is a story Jason Quick wrote today about. Um, the it, today it's it posted on Tuesday, September 28th, uh, in on the athletic again, subscribe to the athletic, read Jason stuff. Um, it, uh, that Neil, whether it's Ben Simmons or anyone else, that the Blazers don't want to package players, they want to trade a, a, a single player. You can read that as CJ for Simmons in the sentence specifically. It said Ben Simmons, also, it's it's not um, media reports or vague, it's Jason Quick, spe- it's Jason Quick, and in like a one specific sentence. Um, but I think like what to read here, the real read on this is like, um, the Blazers don't want to trade multiple parts because they know that they don't have that kind of depth. If they trade CJ and Rocco for Ben Simmons, they're not better because they're missing Robert Covington. If they trade CJ and even Amphrey Simons for uh, Ben Simmons, like if they're missing another guard, then you're relying, like you just, you still don't have the depth you need. This team is still a little bit thin. And I think that's real. Um, And so what some of it is posturing, right? Some of it is like saying, hey, you know, other GMs out there who are reading the reports or whatever, whoever it is, um, reading the reports from other teams, like you, the offer is, is straight across. The offer is not a group. We are not packaging players for sure. But like, um, this is, uh, so yeah, there's some, there's, it is both legitimate and posturing. Um, also it's not media reports. It's Jason Quick. I'm pretty sensitive to that. You should credit reporters for doing their jobs. Our next question comes from James in Beaverton. This is the NBA's 75th anniversary. They'll be celebrating by naming the 75 greatest players of all time. 25 years ago, the Trailblazers' two best players ever, Bill Walton and Clyde Drexler, both made the 50 greatest players list. I would assume that they will remain on the expanded list. Do you think our third best player, Damian Lillard, will make the list as well? Any other players? I'm pretty sure Scottie Pippen and Carmelo Anthony will both get there, but they earned their spots on other teams. Yeah, um, I think it's just Dame. I don't think LaMarcus is there. He would be the only name that's even in contention. LaMarcus and Terry Porter, I don't think either of them will get there. I think Dame's like somewhere in that 65 to 75 range, like back half of the list. They're not, it's not going to be ranked, but like when you're making the list, he's somewhere back there. You know, other other players have had more team success than Dame, but he's, you know, he's an all-time great. And if, if he, you know, um, retired today to go pursue whatever Broadway musicals, he would probably make the Hall of Fame, like as is. So, um, It'd be close maybe, but he'd be up there. Certainly make the Blazers Hall of Fame. So yeah, I think he's, I think he's like, I think he's in the back half of the 75 list for sure. Final question of the show from Rip City at Rip City on they on Twitter who asks, what would be better? CJ reaching those heights he had to start last season again, or Nurk having a dominant career year, fully motivated and conditioned. I really like this hypothetical. I think it's a, I think it's a uh, an inter- in- interesting one to consider for sure. And I, I got this right away. Rip, uh, Rip City sent this to me like two minutes after I posted a tweet soliciting questions. And um, 
here's where I've landed. I've kind of been thinking about it all day long. So I, the question is really good. I like it. Um, I think of the regular season, Nurk, career year Nurk is what you want because the defense and just the size and, and the dynamic of like having a seven foot, 300 pound dude next to Dame play the best basketball of his career for, you know, 80 games. That's, that's, that's what you want. Like that's, that's, that seems in the regular season to be the most, the biggest key. But when you get to the playoffs, um, you know, as bad as the Blazers defense was last year against um, the Nuggets in the playoffs, what really hurt them was they didn't have another offensive player besides Dame. And you can point to their offensive rating and how good they were in the playoffs, but so much of that is skewed by how freaking amazing Dame was in the two overtime game uh, that they lost in game five. Like no one else scored and he did to keep them afloat and he scored a whole bunch of points. Like that's going to, in the, you know, in the final, whatever, 13 minutes of the game, he had something like 24 points. It's just, those are your points per possession. They all come from one player. The numbers don't tell you the whole story and the whole story was you need a little bit of help. So when you get to the playoffs, I think it is like CJ averaging that step. The other part of this is that like, if CJ is about what he was last year and averages, uh, you know, 22 and four, and then you're still going to be pretty good. If, if Nurk doesn't, you know, if Nurk, Nurk's Nurk has a lower floor than CJ. CJ is really, really, really consistent. Like his floor is way up there. He's just going to be what he is. It's just, he was at the beginning of the year averaging 27, four and five shooting 44% on 11 threes a game. Give me that in a playoff series. Give me another dude shooting, shooting 44% from three on, on 10, 10 plus attempts averaging 27 and five dimes. Like that's, when you get to the playoffs, the sort of go get a bucket magic is sometimes what you need. You just need another dude who can go create. Um, and as good as Nurk is, even at his peak, he's never going to be a shot creator. He's going to be a dominant offensive player or defensive player and and a, a good facilitator and maybe a much better finisher around the rim, but he's never going to be a shot creator. And so when you get to the playoffs, give me, so Nurk in the regular season, when we get to the playoffs, give me Christian James McCall. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of mailbag of special delivery mailbag. Uh, not on a Monday this week. Uh, if you want to get involved in a future episode at Mike G rich on Twitter, email me locked on blazers pod at gmail.com. Uh, a reminder, make this your first listen of the day. Check out locked. Open up your, open up your phone, pop in your earbuds, listen to locked on blazers, watch us on YouTube. Uh, if you have not subscribed on the YouTube channel, please do that. Please. If you're listening to me right now, um, phone, your phone's probably in your hand. Quite frankly, if you're listening to me right now, grab your phone, go to YouTube, Search Lockdown Blazers and smash that subscribe button. It's the best way to support the show. We're trying to grow this new video platform. Also, I want to say like this week, I'm launching the video and uh, launching the video platform of this podcast. It's still available wherever you already get podcasts. Um, it's it's that and that part isn't going to change, but it's been a technical challenge for me. Like I'm, I'm learning this. I'm going to get really good at it. Um, I, I want this to be really good, but it's, um, you know, I'm I'm three days into this thing and I'm still learning. So thanks for sticking with me. Um, I know the last episode, if you're just listening to it in the podcast feed, the, the audio was kind of um, troubling. It wasn't the most uh, wonderful thing to listen to. I think I've solved that um, that issue. So I appreciate y'all. I really do. I want to, I really want to say that, like, thank you so much for rocking with me and thanks for being patient with me. Thanks for being supportive and thanks for supporting the show. I love doing this and I can't do it without you. So thanks for listening and thanks for, um, you know, rolling through the ups and downs. Uh, the graph's pointing up. I've, I've figured out some of my tech issues and hopefully, uh, we are, we are a smooth sailing from this point on. Uh, we got good shows the rest of the week. Uh, we're going to have some player previews. We'll talk about what happens at training camp. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Make sure you check back. Like I said, first listen every single day. It's a daily podcast on Portland Trailblazers, and we're back to five days a week. So tell your friends about it. Tell them they can get it wherever they already get podcasts and on YouTube. Thanks for listening. Talk to you all soon.